so what I'd like to do is just give you an outline as to the structure and what we're what we're hoping to do. Um, I'll give a very quick overview as to how the course works at NIDA and then really and truly it's um, let's open it up for questions. Uh, so anything you wish to ask us about the training, about the course, uh, we'll see if we can provide you with some answers uh, and, and let's see where that conversation goes. So as you know, NIDA's three year course in acting um, is really a, a flagship course in Australia. It's probably one of the finest conservatoire trainings um, on the planet. I would say that, uh, but I think it is an exceptional course and we are very blessed in a way to be working with fantastic artists and practitioners. So Katerina, who is on this call with me, is our head of voice. We have Nicole Stinton, who is our head of music, and we have Gavin Robbins, who is our head of movement. And how our course works is that we teach, uh, our, we train our actors um, first and foremost through four disciplines. The disciplines of movement, music, voice and acting. Ultimately, our training and our philosophy of practice is that we're, we, we encourage an embodied learning and that is learning through doing. So it's a very practical on the floor uh, working every single day, um, engaging in, in the various disciplines. And the other thing that I think is really worth um, mentioning at the start is that we, we, our view is that as artists, you have to find the tools that will work for you. For us, every actor who comes through the door brings their own sense of cultural self, who they are, their histories, their aspirations. And for us, um, what's important is to recognise that individuality, that difference, but also try to collectively um, develop a strong sense of an ensemble. Because the people who come in at first year are going to be the people who will go through the training with you. And if we can find a way to build a cohesive group that can share and support each other, it makes the journey and the challenge of the training so much easier. So how do we do that? Um, simply, simply put, we when we reflected on the course and redesigned it, we took the view that the first year should be about the self, the second year is about other, and the third year is really about putting everything together in your professional year. So for us, the first year really is looking at, when we talk about self, what do you get for yourself for nothing? Who are you? What sort of artist are you at this moment in time? What strengths, what um, areas do you need to challenge yourself in? Uh, um, what do you need to learn in order to grow? And so through each discipline area, we provide a, ver a variety of experiences that enable you to challenge yourself and discover something about yourself, who you are, what you are, what are your interests? We enable a lot of um, opportunities for students to work from uh, material that will speak to their sense of cultural self or political, social um, areas of interest or thematic areas of interest. So we are not very much, very strong on prescriptive texts. We want you, the actor, be, to become a responsible, um, socially aware, socially engaged artist, but one that can actually generate work and find the material that you, that you need in order to open up your challenges. By the end of, and what we do in the first year is, we basically have technical classes, so disciplines related to movement, voice, acting and music in the morning. And then we have opportunities to synthesize, bring together those disciplines in the afternoon through scene study, um, exercises, etudes, all sorts of other activities that we manage throughout the training to give you the opportunity to start putting these tools together. Pardon me. Towards the end of your first year, we also start to introduce you to screen training. One of the unique aspects of NIDA's training is that we introduce actors to screen and thread screen training throughout the three years of the training. The importance of this is, is self-evident. In Australia, the industry is constantly evolving and actors who come to us need to be able to work across a variety of platforms and different forms and also in, in, in media that may yet emerge. Um, as we know, the lockdown has prov provided us with an enormous range of challenges, but also opportunities for us to actually explore how do we tell stories in a different type of space. So at the end of the first year, we're hoping the actors will have got a sense of who they are. They will have um, um, acquired a lot of skills and technique 
and begin to practice those in their break. And then in the second year, they come back and we look at the idea of the other. Now, for us, what that means is that you're looking at the possibility of transformation. So as the actor, how do you move to a character that is um, wildly different from who you may be? Um, how do you deal with language and text that is very perhaps challenging or rich or um, beyond the normal um, televisual naturalism that we perhaps experience uh, most commonly in our lives in terms of storytelling? So we're looking at heightened text and language and we use a couple of um, canonical works. They're the only two canonical works that we focus on at NIDA. It's not to say that we don't dig deeply and broadly into a wide range of material, but we look at Shakespeare and we look at the Russian naturalists. In Shakespeare, we're looking at the heightened text and language. And what we do in second year is we increase the amount of material that you might be working on as an actor alongside the technical disciplines that will su support you in that work. So, for instance, Katerina runs a project. She may talk about this a little bit in a little while where she's exploring heightened text and language in the sense of rhetoric, uh, rhetoric and political speeches and all that work and the detail in terms of language and figures of speech pass across into the Shakespeare. And likewise, the work that the actors might be doing on the Shakespeare pass across um, backwards into that work. So in a way, what we're doing is we're looking at how we can interlace our teaching so that it becomes like a lattice rather than a separate path. The Russian project for us is a very key element where we take the actors into a journey of looking at a world that is wildly different to ours and we look at plays uh, plays by the great Russian writers such as Gorky and Chekhov. We aim to stage a workshop production of those and at the same time what we're looking at is um, the full embodiment of the inner life and the external life and the challenge of both of those um, elements for the actor. Uh, that project in, in particular culminates in a, a unique uh, project for us and that is the uh, project which links stage to screen so the actor being fully embodied in the Chekhov uh, world if you like through its work through the workshop um, we then spend a day shooting each of those plays but in a different context so a television director comes in with a DOP and a sound op and they work with the actors to restage and film elements of those productions so that the actor understands that um, there is not really a great difference between the theatre and the screen. It's all acting. It's about the frame, how the camera looks at the image and how you as, a, as an actor respond to the demands of shot and focus. Um, the second half of the year in your second year is taken up with some fantastic physical projects such as Embody. And Embody is a project that enables groups to develop and create work under the guidance of our head of movement, Gavin Robbins. And these works uh, develop the creativity of our students in terms of coming up with ideas, shaping ideas, shaping storytelling and leading to a performance um, that is shared in-house and with um, selected guests and friends uh, at the end of term three. The year culminates in a in a physical project, a, a theatre project where we look at two plays. So this year we're looking at Luigi Pirandello's Six Actors in Search of an Author and Howard Barker's Scenes from an Execution. The aim here is to actually give the actors the scaffolding ready for their professional year. So it's an opportunity for the actors to bring all the skills that they've acquired over the time that they've been in training from movement, music, uh, um, uh, voice and acting together in a physical um, representation of a play. Parts are shared and what happens is that the um, actors this year are going to have a unique experience of working in a repertoire. Uh, so that means basically they'll be showing their performances every day but altering um, the venue and changing casts and companies. They finish the year with a screen project two weeks of shooting. And what happens in this project is that uh, the actors create short scenic uh, material, maybe 10 exchanges, and they work with uh, film artists who will teach them how to work technically for an Australian and American environment, but also in a European context and, and alternative context where the perhaps there is a greater degree of flexibility about how a scene might be shot. So we're trying to prepare our actors for a, a range and a di diversity of um, cinematic 
and filmed experiences. So all that scaffolding really leads to the final year of the training, which is the professional year. In professional year, the, the balance, if you like, between classwork and, and um, application shifts. And so there is much more time spent applying the skills um, and the techniques. In our first term, we have uh, two major projects. There is the uh, American Play Project and a voice and speech project called Articulate and Articulate and Voice Reels, which are run through the voice department. So the American Play Project links accent, links movement, links acting, links musicality uh, through into a performance of a classic American play and gives the actors an opportunity to develop those, um, those verbal skills and deal with uh, language, text, rhythm um, in a different manner. And alongside that, there is the Articulate project, which teaches the actor ADR skills, um, successful microphone technique, and enables them to respond to dropping in text, which is something that may happen in your career in the future when you've been shooting a film and you may need to drop in a line or two in terms of post-production. Second term at the moment at NIDA is our, what we call our production term. And we have a number of uh, productions that are realized fully. And this is a wonderful opportunity for NIDA's actors to work collaboratively across all courses at NIDA. One of, the, one of NIDA's great and unique um, elements, in my view, is the um, extent of cross collaboration between different courses. So technical and stage management students work with lighting designers, work with sound designers, work with prop makers, work with scenic and construction artists. They all work with designers, costumiers, um, realizing production in a manner that is similar to perhaps uh, the experience that they may have in a professional theater. After that project, we have two final terms. And in those periods, our students are shooting short films. So they're preparing their show reels. They are undertaking a, a project we call Unplugged, which is an informal um, opportunity for agents and industry guests to come and view the work of the actors prior to their, their final graduation shows. And in the final term, our training is, is based around a, uh, a number of um, public productions, which again are fully realized. And we culminate our academic year and the study for the students with a showcase, which again brings casting directors, agents, the leading artistic directors and interested industry guests to view the work of the actors. And they see the actors both on stage and on screen in terms of their film material. So that's in a way an overview of how the course works. Um, Katarina, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Oh, John, I thought that was really concise and succinct. And I thought it really outlined what we do quite well, particularly the idea that the course interlaces the subjects and disciplines into each other. It's not just acting as one discipline, but rather what acting is in terms of voice, body, acting. And what makes us unique as well, I think, is the idea that we incorporate music into that. I thought you did a great job, John. Thank you. So, so I suppose at this point, um, what I would like to do is throw it to you and ask um, any of you who are viewing this uh, to send in your questions and we'll look forward to trying to answer them. So I have a question here from Princess Dibs, who's asking um, for the audition video, do I have to perform both pieces right after each other or can I merge two separate videos for the submission? At the moment, we prefer them to be two separate videos because it's easy for us to view them. Uh, one of the experiences we had last year was the was that um, if we had two different videos, because of the way our system is set up, it's easier for us to actually look at them, grade them, have conversations about the candidates. So if you can do them as two separate videos, I think all the instructions are actually on the website. Thank you. Lovely. So we have a question here from um, from somebody who's asked, how does the singing actor stream differ from the non singing singing actors stream? So from our point of view, one of the things that we looked at when we um, under Andrew Ross's leadership at the time of the music department was the idea of how do we um, develop the 
singing actor as opposed to perhaps the traditional pathways into music theatre. And one of the things that matters for us is that the first things, um, the first thing that's important is that the acting's got to be there. Um, the ability for the candidate to to do the acting and, and get through that side of the um, audition process is paramount. And then the singing comes on top. How this how the streams work at the moment in the training is that we have a, a dedicated afternoon once a week when the different cohorts sit, split apart and the singing actors take care of uh, explore very particular projects uh, related to singing, maybe dance and and other skills pertinent to that particular discipline. And the acting stream uh, undergo a series of other tasks. And what we found is that they are relatively complementary. So the aim behind it was to um, was to try and be able to have a parallel stream where complementary skills were being learnt uh, at the same time. Um, however, um, one of the things that is exciting about Nicole Stinton joining us is that we will review the structure of that of that element of the training and see if there's a way in which we can do it better. So at the moment, what happens is that in the first two years of your training, um, there will be an afternoon which enables uh, what we call technical disciplines to occur in different in different forms. Um, this year, for an example, uh, in the first term, I led us a, a deep dive into some lab and working actions. Meanwhile, the, the singing actors were exploring different ways of approaching the text and the language of, of, the, of the song in relation to musicality. So there, there were sort of complementary elements that, um, that went side by side. There's a question, where do I find my application okay. number? I'm afraid I'm not the one to answer that one. That would be a question for me, John. So the Lovely. application, you would have been sent an email when you made your application and that would have been um, sent to you in an email when you set that up. And so your application number will be on that email. And that will give you access to your portal. Lovely. There's another question. What do you look for in a great audition video? Katarina, do you want to have a... Yeah, I was about to say, why don't I grab that one? So it's an interesting question. It's a question we get a lot, obviously, because we see a lot of auditions. And we have a set of criteria that we look at. The main thing is readiness for training, as well as a creative and imaginative reading of the text and the language. So what we're looking for, first and foremost, is are you going to be... Uh, happy at NIDA and remember that there are many drama schools across the world. This might not be the right drama school for you. So it's a, a two-way street, the audition process. So in the first instance, we're looking for, are you able to come to the text and language with a creative and imaginative eye? What is the you that you bring into the text and the language? So we ask you to choose pieces that are close to something that interests you, that tells us a little bit about yourself, and that then allows you to delve deeper into the character and the given circumstances. And then we can see what you bring in terms of your creative and imaginative response to that. When you get to the second stage, of the audition process. Then we look at a third monologue and we sometimes review your first and second monologue. And we might work it a little bit more by giving you a completely different set of given circumstances. So there we might be looking at how you take direction. Are you bringing yourself, your sense of self and your sense of play and imaginative, again, response to what's given to you in the moment by the panel? And the last thing we do is we look at how each individual fits within the ensemble that we're building towards the end. So what is it that we think you bring to that ensemble? So it's it's a two way street by the time you get to the last process. And the final thing we do, of course, is an interview. And in that interview, we ask you questions, but it also gives you the opportunity to ask us questions about NIDA and about the way NIDA works and what it might be like for you as a student. What will the student experience be for you? So it's it's a, it's a big and long process, but we do that so you're aware and you know that NIDA is the right school for you. There's another question here, which is, do we have to use the monologues that were given to us or are we able to use any of our choice? 
In an ideal world, I would say use the monologues that we have um, prepared. We're trying to create a range of, of opportunities and, and different voices, in, particularly in the selection of contemporary and classical or heightened text and language areas. However, having said that, um, people do choose to bring other pieces of work to, to the table and that's, um, that, that is a possibility. The challenge is this. If you've been working on something at school, for instance, uh, the the reality, the actuality is often is that although it may be very good, um, it may not necessarily serve your needs as a young actor or, or performer. And so that's why we try to um, curate a range of opportunities for you um, in terms of um, speeches and, and monologues. Um, so, so I would say have a look on the list and choose something that you can gravitate towards. And then if that doesn't work, um, then obviously make a choice. Um, Bo asks, what would you say the biggest differences are in the film training between the BFA and the Diploma of Stage and Screen Performance? Um, I would say that the biggest difference is that you have time. In the BFA, you have a three year program, which is thoroughly um, developing your artistry as, a, as an actor. Um, and our, th our screen training is laced and, and threaded through that training over, uh, and very carefully constructed over that period of time. Um, more time gives you more competence, gives you more skills, gives you more ability or opportunities. Um, I would say that I, th I would say there are no real short tracks, uh, shortcuts. Um, and it's I think the more skill you have, the more time you invest in yourself in terms of training, um, the better off you, you are going to have. Because in a way, what we're really looking at is not just turning out actors, but we're turning out actors who are interested in the art, who are interested in the creativity, who are interested in sustainable long term careers um, that are based on something um, strong and profound within themselves. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. There's a question there, John, about yep. accents. Yeah. I can't quite read it, but I think. Uh, oh, sorry. How much about... time do you spend on developing accents? Yes, it's a really great question. Sometimes when we look at voice work, we might think of accents as just a small part of the course or voice work. And actually, they're both one and the same. So we pretty much start accents and dialects from the beginning. We start to look at, at your mouth, your tongue, your lips, and how you use those habitual patterns of speech. And so that's really the beginning of the training of accents. Towards the end of your first year, however, you look at phonetics more specifically. So you might look at placement, manner, where those sounds are placed and how you might draw those in a symbol, a symbol of sound in phonetics. And so then really at the end of your first year, we're starting to look more deeply at phonetics in terms of accents and dialects. Then in second year, as John's already mentioned, when we look at self, to other and character work, that's where we really start to delve into character changes and so therefore accent and dialect changes and how you can make an accent and dialect part of your acting experience rather than separate from. So that we're using sound and changes of sound in the mouth to create accents and dialects. So we learn all sorts of dialects across the globe at the moment, at the second, the end of the second year, you can choose a couple of accents and dialects that you would like to choose to learn from anywhere across the world. And so uh, you do scenes and monologues in those accents, as John's already mentioned. A lot of people who come to NIDA, the expectation is that they might work in the UK or work in America. So we spend a lot of time on the American accent and a wide range of British accents, but also, of course, accents and dialects from across the globe, as I've mentioned. And we do that then, from then on, all the way through the training to the end. And you'll find a lot of our students will choose accents and dialects to do their showcase or their show reel in. So it's really about how you're using the flexibility of your voice and your consonants and speech. And so really from the beginning, but you gradually progress until you're fluent in an accent and dialect. I think while we wait for the next question to come, I, I would actually say um, one of the things that is also very um, challenging for young actors in training is the work on voice, because so much of our psyche is wrapped up in our perception of self and sound and in a training um, that your biggest encounter is going to be with yourself. Uh, 
and I think that's something that's really worth thinking about when you um, think about your your training. Um, An acting training isn't actually just about giving you the tools. Actually, it's creating a space where you can be brave enough to encounter yourself um, in a supportive environment. Um, there's been a lot of conversation recently about self, self spaces in sorry safe spaces. Um, I tend to take the view that it's much more useful to find brave spaces where you can actually take risks, challenge yourself. Um, but I think the thing that really should be um, you know held on to is the idea that actually as an actor in training you are encountering yourself a lot more than you possibly think. Um, Michaela's asked, with auditioning via self-tape, should we pretend we are in an audition room or should we treat it like more like screen acting? Um, I would say just tell the story. It's all storytelling. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're in a room or you're in front of a camera. It's a story you're trying to tell. You're trying to affect change, perhaps in another character or the audience. So think of it in terms of storytelling. Um, what is this character doing to somebody else and how are they going to affect change? So that so you become less conscious or self-conscious, self-aware that can get in the way of 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 the imaginative engagement that you're seeking to uh, um, to develop really with the piece. Katarina, do you want to add anything to that or? No, I was just going to say, I agree with John. Obviously, the story is the most important thing in your engagement with the, the language and your engagement with the imagery. Do whatever it is that you, makes you feel comfortable that's going to give us the best view of you and your best self. That's really the most important thing. We don't want to prescribe too much how to do things because we don't want it to be stilted and held. We want you to be able to be creative. I've used the word creative a lot, but it's a huge part of what we do, mm. looking at how creative and imaginative you are. So whatever works for you. Obviously, you're not going to do a side shot so we can't see your face. Read the instructions on the website really carefully so that you understand that although we want you to be comfortable, we also need to see you and hear you so that we get a clear image and picture of, of what it is that you're offering for us. So, And I think I would just add to that, we were going to refresh um, our how-to guide uh, in terms of self-taping because it, it actually speaks to this, it's 2020. Um, and unfortunately, like a lot of Australia, we're in lockdown. So we haven't been able to achieve that, but we may look at um, re-establishing that link on the portal so that there is at least a guide that you can look at to perhaps give you some further information um, and some ideas. There's a question here from somebody who's asked, uh, was just wondering if it's harder for recent high school graduates to be accepted than those who are older. Um, I would say that it, it, I don't know that it's necessarily harder, but I don't know that it's necessarily um, easier either. I think the challenge is this. Acting training is really an examination of yourself um, in a context. And one of the challenges that you will face as an actor is portrayal of other human beings, um, for, you know, their best bits and their worst bits. I think that um, sometimes you will do yourself a favour if you've taken more time away from from school and don't just think of of the progression of oh, I've done school and I'm now going into acting training. There are a number of reasons because in a way I would argue that perhaps the the type of education that you might have experienced is preparing you to um, operate more in a binary world of correct or incorrect. Yes, no, um, I've got a successful exam result, I haven't. Whereas actually the sort of thinking that we need to to inculcate in, in an acting training is, is perhaps of a different type and a different, um, it, it's much more experiential. We want you to be in tune with your body, your mind, your psyche um, and I think personally, um, you'll probably do yourself a favour coming a little bit later. That's a, that's a personal view. But um, but there are students who join us um, straight out of um, high school and students who come who may have had other careers and and um, and so on. So it's I think each year is different, and we as a team take that responsibility of finding the cohort, finding the ensemble very seriously, and we look for what I would regard as a, a representation of Australia as it is now, culturally, socially, um, and so and so forth. There's a question there, Katarina. Um, I'm going to 
throw this one to you. What type of questions should we expect if we get to the interview? Ah, so really that again, another really good question uh, because we have another set sort of of questions that we ask. John and I usually do the interviews at the end of, of auditions and it's a really great opportunity for us to get to know you. So we can ask things that are a little bit about why do you want to come to NIDA? What is it that attracts you to NIDA? What do you offer in terms of if we offered you a place on the course, what would you bring? What's your creative and imaginative life like? We might ask you things like, is there anything that NIDA can do for you? Are there any uh, particular needs that you have that are different to somebody else? And what can off NIDA offer you? in terms of what do we need to prepare for you coming to NIDA. We might ask you things like what movies and what sorry what movies and films you've seen recently. I know that it's difficult during COVID to get out and see anything current but what's your broad range of literature or art? Have you been out into the world and gone to art galleries even if they're online? Have you seen theatre online? What is it that it that interests you? So what interests do you have politically, historically, socially? So these are the sort of questions we ask. What is it uh, about you that's interesting? So be prepared for those sort of questions at the end. Yeah, the quickest way to develop your imagination is to read novels because it invites the inner picture. Um, and I would say that's a really useful thing for um, actors in training. Read, 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 and then read some more. Anyhow, um, there's a lovely question here, which is really interesting. Um, um, what advice would you give to somebody who's re-auditioning in terms of taking a different approach to the audition and ways to improve on past auditions? Um, the very fact that you that somebody may have auditioned um, a year ago, two years ago, and then is coming back to audition, to me suggests that they will have changed anyhow. You will have grown as a human being. You will have had life experience. You would have lived. You will um, may have broken a few hearts or had your heart broken. Um, who knows? Um, but there's a variety of things that will have happened. And, and in a way, I would say be yourself. Um, share, you know, connect to the story that you're trying to tell. Uh, look at the imagery. How does that resonate with you? Try and share some of that, because I think what what is interesting for us is that we we do follow um, candidates who have been unsuccessful. We are aware when when a candidate comes through the door that we've seen before and we do have access to notes and so forth. And it's really very interesting watching the development. Sometimes the development doesn't happen straight away and it might be two or three years later and then suddenly, ah, something's happened. So so um, I think that's one of the things that's um, most key is be yourself, be yourself. And, and don't change anything necessarily unless you've learned some new things that you want to try and apply. Now I'm getting Can a I just add there, John? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to add, you might say to yourself, well, I was being myself, but I think what John's referring to is sometimes people audition for us thinking that they know what we want or they're trying to give us what we want. And so by doing that, you're, you become a little bit more demonstrative or demonstrating what you think we're looking for. So the best thing is to just let go and allow the whole process to change you and just go with whatever we give you. If we give you a direction, try not to be hesitant or to lack the ability to just say yes and. We're going to offer something and it's your job to just say yes and and run with it. So Often, if you haven't been successful, it's because there's an ability for you to try to continue to give us what you think we want rather than what yeah. we're actually looking for, which is for you to be free and in your, and as John said, to be yourself. I think that's really key. The idea that actually, in a way, the most successful artists destroy their work. You absolutely have to every every night, you know, you, you walk off stage, that performance over and done with, get rid of it. Never go out trying to recreate exactly what you um, what you experienced that night because you've changed the following day, as has the audience. And so the interconnection and the um, the engagement is going to be a different thing. Yes, there may be a shape, a form that is being prescribed by the director and the lighting designers and so forth. But the actual engagement between you, the fellow actor and the audience is always different. And so in a similar way, 
every time somebody gives you an idea in in a audition environment says try this or can you do it like that just say yes let, you know just say yes and have a go um because you may surprise yourself and it's that it's the it's the um perhaps that fearful chaotic space that i would regard as being the brave space that becomes the most interesting one for me i have a question here from somebody who's asked i'm not sure if this has been asked but is there much stroke any focus on dance in the course and i would say yes there is we have a, a wide range and diversity of, of of approaches to uh movement disciplines and i think one of the things that's well worth thinking about is that although um although for instance one might take a a, a particular view about there's an element of ballet or there's an element of contemporary dance or there's an element of of, of another form of dance we we have a fantastic artist um tiana canterbury who comes in and teaches african hip-hop um we have natasha crane who also comes in and does contemporary uh, work the exercise the dance is not just about the dance itself, but it's also helping you in other ways in terms of acting because it's teaching you about cross patterning. Um, it's teaching you coordination. It's teaching you spatial awareness. It's teaching you about dynamics and the use of dynamics in, in your body. And it's it's uh, actually loosening you up and perhaps reframing how you um, experience movement. So yes there's a lot there is a, a lot of dance and again structured and threaded through the training uh, but it's also dance like any of our particular disciplines always has another element um, behind it that can be used in another manner yeah how does nida handle classes and practice during lockdowns mm -hmm. since it seems acting would be quite a difficult skill set to learn via zoom alone in an apartment i think you're right um Yes, you know, roll down your spine, just make sure you don't hit your head on the coffee table um, <laughs> as you do your warm up. Um, it is a challenge. I have to be, we have to be honest, we've managed it twice. So last year we did a big pivot and we were earlier in the year when we went into lockdown. So we were in March, we went into lockdown and, and that process um, continued for, uh, through to July. So what we did was we tried to bring forward a lot of theory subjects that we could deliver through an online process. Um, some of the learnings we had were were to do with how much time students were spending online. And so so one one of the things we did was we restructured our approach to training and we um, we delivered um, intensity, but also created space for the actors to actually have reflection and downtime. And what we've been looking at um, uh, what we've been looking at lately is um, we've again shifted back following some of those patterns, but we're at a different time in our academic year and we have some different challenges. So, for instance, there was a, an audition practice um, uh, element for third years that we were due to deliver to an audition panel. Because of COVID, we haven't been able to do that. But what we've done is pivoted. We've turned the auditions into self tapes, so it's still an audition and they will be reviewed and, and, and marked in, in that manner. So we try to be as flexible as we can uh, within the training, but I think um, I think uh, it, it is challenging and, and uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, I hope that we will be out of lockdown as soon as we possibly can um, and back into a building, but um, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, there's a, a question here about does gender matter when cho choosing your monologue? Um, no, not really. Do what you want. Um, do and, and, and explore it. Um, we may ask you why you chose that monologue. Um, if we're in an audition si situation towards the end of the year for recalls, um, we, we may um, engage with you on that. But, um, but I think if something's speaking to you, then go and explore that. Katarina, do you want to add anything there? Oh, to you're absolutely that? allowed to play around with the text. Uh, yeah, that's yes. the whole point. Uh, yeah, what yeah. is it that you bring? I think I've said a few times and I'll probably say mm. it again before this online info session is over. It's what you bring. So if you don't play, that's what a play is. We're asking you to come into a room and play with us. So play as much as you like. Uh, we might change it. We might say, hmm, hang on a minute, why don't you try it this way to see if you can take direction and play in a different way, in a different direction. But yes, play with the text. It's not about being authentic necessarily, uh, but it's about, again, what John said, the word interesting, imaginative and creative you are with the text. Yeah. yeah. 
I think we might have another question popping up. Are we allowed to play around with the text to make it more authentic to us? Um, I would say one of the first disciplines for the actor is to um, honour the text that's been given to you. That's what um, we just answered, John. That was yeah, all yeah. 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 I think um, I think you can play around with gender, but I think if the text says this group of words in this order, I would say mm, that's one of the first elements that you need to um, deal with. Yeah. Um, in states online that gaining admissions BFM is talent based. Can you potentially get in without having completed extensive experience prior? Yes, you can. Yes, you can, because um, talent is choice in action. Um, as Stella Adler said, if I'm correct. Um, and I think this is this is one of the interesting things is that you don't have to have had a lot of experience. Um, sometimes the rawness and the energy and the dynamic that uh, um, somebody who hasn't got a lot of experience brings into the room can complement somebody who's got experience, but perhaps doesn't have the same bravery or um, or freedom. So so I think that that becomes really uh, one of the interesting elements for us. You don't have to have a, a lot of experience. Um, a, a recent graduate of ours who is currently um, in home and away came to us with uh, almost no experience um, other than um, a period of time in another a, a, in a completely different um, career, but has actually made a successful um, engagement with the training and is now a, a regular in home and away. Um, there's a question there. In reviewing hundreds of the same pieces in the audition process, what instantly grabs your attention and excites you as a as a panel? Do you want to have a go at that, Catherine? Yeah, I, I, I think I like that. I think that's a really quite great question. We see a lot of the same monologues yeah. and it doesn't matter about the monologue itself. We have seen some of the ones we because we put them on the list. We see them over and over and over again. What makes it interesting, what excites us and grabs our attention is the way you and what you bring to that monologue, how you, as John said, what choices you make in terms of your action on each thought at each moment and how you excite that. Do you have joy and playfulness with the text? And so that's the really important thing. The monologue itself doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. I just mean in terms of whether we've seen it a hundred times or whether we've seen it the first time. One year there was a, a lovely young lady. She got in tonight and she did a, a monologue that I'm not very fond of. And it was funny and it was fresh and it was new. And she came to the text with a completely different angle of what it might mean. And as a result, we thought, oh, that's interesting. She's making interesting choices. And so we took her into the next round. So that's really what we're looking for. Yeah. And, um, and there's, okay, I'll answer the next one, John. Yeah, yeah, go on. Do you suggest if it fits the story to use accents if you feel comfortable? We usually ask you not to do an accent because at this first round and this first stage, we want you, we want to hear your voice and see your body. So we want to know what your instrument sounds like, feels like, and how you're using it well. So for the first stage, it's preferable not to use an accent. If you really want to, then absolutely go ahead. As we've said, it's all your choice, but we would tell you in the second round to take out the accent so we could hear what your voice is doing. There's a, a, a really interesting question here. Which acting techniques, theatre practitioners do you focus on? Do you spend longer on specific ones, e.g. Uta Hagen, Stan Slavsky, etc.? Um, I think we do use Uta Hagen. We use Stan Slavsky. We use a range of practitioners. And this goes back to the very early um, start of the conversation where every actor who walks through the door is a unique individual um, human being. And every actor who comes to us on the training will respond to the training differently and their journey will be unique to them. So just as there are a multitude of different individuals in the in the building, there are we use a variety of different tools and techniques um, to train our actors in so that they can find the way that works best for them. Um, and I think this is one of the key elements. The acting training isn't about you've got to follow this particular path or this particular practitioner's way of working in order to become a successful actor. What you actually have to do is find your path 
and and the journey is actually finding and developing your own process um, through the three years of training and also off into your life thereafter. So so we use um, we will introduce you to fundamental principles that I think are perhaps universal in a Western context. And I, I use that advisedly, the idea of objective and action and so forth. Um, as I, I was on a conversation recently with a practitioner from North, a uh, very well known North America, uh, American school who said, um, well, you know, we start our students off very simply. Um, what does Winnie the Pooh want? Honey, 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 honey. Um, and that's basically, it, you know, what are you going to do to get the honey? Well, <laughs> and, the, and those are the, you know, the things that you're going to do. So so um, maybe there's a new theory here. No, uh, I think that <laughs> the, the, the Pooh theory, sorry. The Winnie the Pooh. The Winnie the Pooh and acting. Yeah. Book, John. I love and the art of motorbikes. Um, <laughs> but I think um, I think we like to uh, introduce you to a wide range of practitioners so that you can actually find you, the individual, find your own way, find your own journey and, and you build up a toolkit. The most important thing is to have a variety of tools that you can dip in and out um, according to the, the challenge that you're facing in any given set of circumstances. In the life experience question of the application, should we include details such as mental health, heartbreak, challenges, etc., or should we keep it cheery? Share what you want to share. Don't overshare. <laughs> you know. Um, Look, John, you think. said earlier, didn't you, that your yeah. life experience that you bring to the work. So yeah. we're interested in, in the depth of your life experience. That could be cheery. It could be a little not cheery. Of course, you choose to share what you want to share and share. And we have had people share things that are, are quite deep. We yep. don't share those with others. No. The forms are private and confidential. They don't go outside the panel. And uh, you choose to share what you want to share. It doesn't have to be cheery. It doesn't have to be gloomy. It could no. be a balance of both, but you choose what you want to. Yeah. Um, now I'm getting very close to needing to um, draw things to a close here as I've got to teach it too. So um, there is a question here. Maybe we might have a couple more. There's a question here. Can you give a, a brief rundown on what happens through the recall audition process? Um, so, yes, in an ideal world, um, we are going to be in the room with our prospective candidates. And so what we tend to do is we will have a group of people who will come together to do the recall. And often Katerina leads a warm up with the group and puts them through, um, quite literally takes them through a process of warming up their bodies, their minds, their imagination, um, and play some games and gets them working, get, get the group working together. Because in a way it's like a microcosm of the ensemble um, experience. It also gives us an opportunity to observe how you work and how you play perhaps with each other. And then what happens is that in years gone by, we would have um, maybe 24 people in that space. 12 people would share their work and another 12 would share their work in a different room. Um, and at that point, uh, the candidates would just uh, perform their first piece. And we just take some notes. We would then bring everybody back together again um, and the panel swap over. And at that point, we work a second piece. So then we're, we're engaging in a challenge of, of, well, how can you adapt um, in the circumstances. Last year, because of COVID, we weren't able to operate quite the same way. And so what we would do is often just see the first piece and go straight into uh, working the second pieces, but with all the panel in the one room, because there were uh, conditions around the maximum safe um, numbers in, in, in um, enclosed environments. Uh, we encourage you to play and explore um, and once we've had that chance to see the first piece and the second piece as a panel, we'll have a discussion and we may then ask you to do a third piece. What happened last year was that uh, our head of music and uh, Andrew Ross was in the room. And so those uh, those candidates who were really interested in the singing actor could do their third piece, which was a song. And this year, Nicole Stinton has put a list of songs up uh, on the website as, uh, as as potential third pieces. So when we examine the third piece, what we're doing is, again, <clears throat> exploring how you work on the floor, how you adapt to changing given circumstances, for instance. Um, and we're trying to tease out um, your voice, if you like, and who you are as, as the artist. And then at the end of that, 
process, um, we will make a selection as to whether we put you on a shortlist or whether we actually um, are unable to take you further at this moment in time. So that's really what happens. There's one more question there. What material wise, what kind of monologues do you look for in callbacks? Um, you you make the choice. I think the most important thing is that as a as an actor, you've you've got to have some agency. You've got to have some uh, ability to make choices and and be responsive and find things that interest you. So although we have a, a list that says, look, here are a number of monologues that you can choose from, when it comes to the third year. Uh, sorry, the third piece, I would always um, suggest to you, you know, go and find something that really interests you, something that you feel passionately connected um, to. Yeah. There's a question here. Can you audition and perform in professional productions whilst at NIDA? Um, simply put, no. <laughs> uh, so the challenge here is, is uh, the training gives you a chance to actually redevelop yourself, reposition yourself. It's so some people come to NIDA having had a degree of success as young actors in maybe some te television and film environments. The training gives you an, uh, an opportunity to actually um, quite literally to be in camera and away from the glare of the industry and to reposition yourself. And that may mean that um, that you really need to have that time away from industry to concentrate on your on your the development of your skills, your artistry and your technique. Um, so uh, we don't encourage that. Having said having said that, by the time you get into third year, um, we have made exceptions for students who have had career, what I would call and the team would call career defining opportunities. So a fabulous actor, a recent graduate of NIDA's Bridie McKim had the opportunity to um, go into a, a piece of work called The Heights. And we were able to reframe working with Kylie and the education department, reframe some of the tasks that uh, that would normally have been completed while she was away doing that particular opportunity because it was quite literally career defining. Um, so in third year, we may have a degree of flexibility, but really and truly we we strongly advocate that you, you stay um, the course as it were. And I think I'm going to make this the last question. I'm very sorry to say. Um, do you think a directorial vision is important to acting? And is this something that is part of actor training, acting training at NIDA? Um, that's a really interesting question. Because there's a challenge there. The director stands outside perhaps and has the overview and the actor sits inside and has the experience of, of actually being in. Um, so you've got the, the, the challenge of the microcosm and the macrocosm. Um, I think, let me put it another way. Whilst you're at NIDA, there are a, a, a wide range of projects that you will be engaged in and upon with your peers to develop your own material your own opportunities um, and your own creativity. And so in a way that directorial lens starts to come into play. And the awareness of an actor um, to have a sense of what's the lens that's being um, brought to bear on this particular topic. So it might be how how is the shape of a scene looking or how is the shot in a, in a cinematic context looking can be really useful to understand. Um, but I would also say that that there are times when you've actually just got to get into the messy business of the acting as opposed to necessarily standing outside and, and being objective. Yeah. So um, what I would like to do is say thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to say thank you to Kylie for being here, Katerina. Um, we have some wonderful um, staff in our back room who have been observing and will be willing to answer um, any questions. So Naomi Lennox and Jay um, Delisse, uh, they are part of our SELCA team. And if you have any questions, you can email applications at nida.edu.au if your question has not come up. So um, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank we you wish you well and look forward to seeing you on the floor somewhere in the country. Bye for now. Bye for now.